Union doctors are walking out in their ongoing dispute over pay. Dr Vin Devarka from NHS England has told LBC they have one of the most important roles in the health service. Anybody who's been in hospital or been to a GP surgery will know that most of the time the first person that you will see will be a junior doctor Uh, a doctor who is in training. When we talk about junior doctors, we often think of them as being, um, you know, people with less experience, but actually the range is everybody who's um, just qualified up to people that have had eight or nine years of experience and are about to become GPs or about to become consultants. There's a huge range. The government says calls for a full pay restoration are unaffordable. A 15-year-old has been arrested on suspicion of murder following the death of a teenager on New Year's Eve. Harry Pittman, who was 16, was stabbed on Primrose Hill in North London just before midnight on Sunday. Another teenager was released under investigation yesterday. The UK has joined 11 other countries in a statement condemning Houthi attacks against commercial shipping in the Red Sea. They say the attacks threaten innocent lives from all over the world and constitute a significant international problem. A number of mortgage providers are cutting their rates at the start of the new year. The UK's biggest lender, Halifax, has brought some of its rates down by almost one percentage point, with other providers expected to follow suit. Meanwhile, HSBC is offering a five-year fixed rate of under 4% for some customers. And Russ Bray has told LBC he feels it's the right time for him to give up refereeing darts with a 16-year-old in the final of the World Championship. He'll take charge of his 28th and last final later when Luke Littler faces world number one Luke Humphreys at Ali Pali and the voice of darts says he stands by his decision to step away. When I say it's the right time and it's a young man's fault that's exactly what it is and it's just proven me 100% right. I don't care who wins it doesn't matter to me. Makes no difference to me. I'm up there like, like you say I'm up there to see that both lads you know, get it done fairly obviously and, and I'll call the score so uh, you know honestly I really I know both the kids I know them both you know very well and um, I honestly, honestly don't mind who wins. In the city, the FTSE 100 has closed down 39 points at 76.82. The pound buys $1.26 and one euro 15. LBC weather, winds easing tonight with spells of rain and showers for northern areas. Showers clearing for most in the south, lows of freezing. Mostly dry and bright in the south tomorrow. Heavier spells of rain in the far south though and southeast. Scattered showers in the north, highs of 9 degrees. From Global's newsroom for LBC... I'm Amelia Cox. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with Ian Dale. Hello, a very good evening. It's four minutes past seven on LBC. I'm Ian Dale. Welcome to the programme. I'll be here with you until 10. Uh, We're streaming this hour live on Global Player if you'd like to watch us because we have the Israeli ambassador to the United Kingdom, Zippy Hotovelli, with us. Ambassador, very good evening to you and thanks for coming. I think this is your first interview of the the new year. Now, lots going on today. So let's start off with some of the events of today. Um, uh, Yesterday, uh, there was the killing of the Hamas Deputy Leader Salah al aruri in, uh, in in Lebanon. Um, nobody's taken responsibility for this yet, but your colleague Mark Regev, who of course was your predecessor here uh, so some, really some years ago, yeah. um, somebody I, I know quite well, he has uh, said that he stopped short of confirming Israel has carried out the attack, but he said whoever did it must be clear that this was not an attack on the Lebanese state. It was not an attack even on Hezbollah, the terrorist organisation. Whoever did this surgical strike against the Hamas leadership, whoever did this has a gripe with Hamas that is very clear now I've interpreted that as saying yeah it it was us but we're not prepared to say so quite yet no you know me better than that I think I'm not going to refer to the events yesterday but I am going to refer to the profile of Salah Aruri that as you said was the deputy um, leader of the military branch of Hamas so we're talking about archive terrorists we're talking about a person that was quoted in the past saying my goal in life is to kill as many Israelis as possible he's in charge of a horrible terror attack in 2014, killing innocent three young boys. After the 7th of October, it looks very minor attack, but back then, it shocked Israelis, the fact that there was young boys going from school, they were kidnapped by Hamas, 
Hamas, brutally murdered by Hamas, and protective edge military operations started because of that. So this man is, has blood on his hands, and he's a terrorist. And I think as so, a, so as a, a matter, legitimate target. All I'm saying, as a matter of a policy, Israel said all the leadership of Hamas uh, needs to feel insecure because Israel needs to make sure that Hamas as an organization doesn't exist after October 7th, not with military capabilities or with leadership. All of which leads me to believe that this was done by Israel because you, you've... It's a you, free country, you're allowed to believe whatever well, you believe. <laughs> you, you've, laid, you've laid out the reasons why he might be a legitimate target, but I don't understand why Israel would be reluctant to claim responsibility. All I want to say that I'm, as ambassador, there's some things I can refer to, some things uh, as a matter of a security, um, you know, our uh, rules of security sometimes doesn't allow us to refer to certain events. And, you know, as ambassador, I need to play by the rules. But you're quite happy that uh, this man is no longer living. You know something? I never thought I'll be happy about anyone's death. And um, the truth is, the only thing I'll be happy about that to have our hostages back and to make sure that the people of Israel will be safe again. And unfortunately, this goal hasn't been accomplished yet. And before I came to the studio, Jan, and I want to share this with you and with the listeners, I actually had a very upset um, conversation with um, parents of five young Israeli girls that are now, as we speak, being tortured by Hamas, hold their maybe underground, maybe starving, maybe going through sexual abuse, as we heard in the New York Times, big exposure this week about the horrible sexual crimes Hamas was committing. So those young uh, women, the parents didn't hear anything about their medical condition. One of the girls was hurt by um, a grenade that Hamas was throwing at October 7th. So think about the tragedy those parents are telling me about their young children, they're, they're, they're girls basically, 18, 19, they're teenagers and they're, they're, not, they're not back yet. So we need to make sure that all the women, there are 13 women there, there are over 130 hostages, some of them are old people, some of them are sick people, they all should be coming back home as soon as possible because they're in great danger. There was another um, big incident today, or, or yesterday. Uh, 71 people were killed at a memorial for the Iranian general Soleimani. Um, Iran has reacted very angrily to this. But you put that together with what happened in uh, Lebanon yesterday as well. And it looks as if we're now in the, there's a big danger of this whole conflict escalating into a wider war that isn't just concentrated on Gaza. Would you accept that that looks a possibility now? Well, we are trying to minimise the France to the Gaza front. We are trying to make all the diplomatic efforts possible about the northern border of Israel so people can go back. There are over 100,000 people being evacuated, both from the north and from the south. There are Israeli people, refugees in their own homeland. And we need to make sure that the diplomatic community will put all its efforts, by the way, including the British leadership that is trying to help, uh, to make sure that both um, Hezbollah troops won't be on our communities in the north, just like we've experienced in the south. The same scenario is something Israelis fear to happen again in the north, so we're not willing to bring the people back before it's a safe place for them. And talking about Iran, we just heard Prime Minister Rishi Sunak saying we're not allowed this work of the Houthis that are definitely a proxy of Iran to prevent from a legitimate trade ships to go and uh, navigate in um, this area of the Red Sea and to make sure that freedom of navigation will be kept. And this is part of this international coalition led by the Americans and with the UK's uh, incredible efforts to fight the Houthis. But we need to, to, to call it with its name. It's Iran who's in charge of those but, actions. But, but that again feeds into this growing narrative that this could really escalate into a much wider war, which... Um, I mean, I don't know whether that, that would be in Israel's interest for this, for the conflict to escalate, even in the short term or, or not. What's your view? Our interest is definitely to de-escalate, but our interest also to keep safe our people. We didn't do that on the 7th of October. Israelis are afraid. Uh, and Ian, you know something? 2023 was probably the darkest year 
in Israel's history with this horrible month of October 7th. So we want to make sure that together with our friends around the world, this type of atrocities that Hamas committed will never be repeated, even though it's in Hamas' intentions to repeat on those horrible things. So we want to make sure they won't have the capabilities to repeat that. How how does this end? Because you, you were very clear in an interview that you did with Sky before Christmas that you do not see a two-state solution as any kind of solution here, uh, that you don't believe that the Palestinians have a right to a state. But if the Jewish people have a right to their own homeland state, why don't the Palestinians? So, yeah, and I think... Um Just to make things clear, the Palestinians refused every time they were offered to have their own state, since going back even to 1948. Every time they were offered to have their own state next to the Jewish state, they always refused only for one reason. They wanted to replace the Jewish state. They don't want, didn't want ever to have a state next to Israel. They wanted to replace Israel. And this is part of the problem. And if you're asking me what's the main issue now, Just sticking to slogans is not going to take us anywhere because for a generation of years, leaders from left and right in Israel offered the Palestinians a state. They kept on refusing. And on October 7th, they actually said, what is the real occupation they're against? That it's the very existence of a Jewish state in any borders. So when they want to have a state from the river to the sea and to make sure Palestine is free from Jews, which is a calling for genocide, basically, We need to address that and to make sure that a future peace will be addressed only by and, and, understanding and I, the right I, of the Jewish people to have that. their own state. I understand that. But when you have Israeli government ministers today effectively calling for Gaza to be cleansed of Gazans, and, and that being criticized by the Americans, understandably so, uh, I mean, two wrongs don't make a right, do they? I mean, you, you can't criticize the Palestinians for using that kind of language and then people within your own government, ministers, senior ministers so, within your own government saying something similar on the other side. I can tell you for sure this is not a government policy. The government But they're policy... they're government ministers. Why hasn't Netanyahu sacked them? There is, there is something very strange about Israeli system that ministers can say whatever they want. It's part of our freedom of speech, but... Our policy is made at the moment by the cabinet war and the prime minister said that the Gaza Strip should go through two important things for a better future, both for us and the Palestinians. One is demilitarization of the Gaza Strip. Second is de-radicalization of the education system in the Palestinian uh, schools. And we know that those are the same schools that were teaching those children that Jews can be killed, women can be raped. Uh, this was basically a Nazi ideology being taught under the UN UNRWA schools. So I think we all should learn our lesson from that and to understand this cannot, you know, but, be, be some, get, get, some type of a future, um, you know, better generation. That get, we'll given this conflict is clearly going to go on for some time, the television pictures that we see every night show signs of devastation. You, you will say, well, look, we, we are trying to target as much as possible. But those are not the pictures that we see. We see whole streets devastated, not individual houses or offices, whole streets, whole communities devastated, schools gone, hospitals gone. How, how does a community come back from that? Well, um, first of all, I really want to mention the fact that Gaza has an underground tunnel city. And in order to get to this underground tunnel city, those areas must be destroyed. And one of the things we expose to the world <coughs> after getting into um, the areas in Gaza that we try to find all those tunnels and underground metro city that Hamas has built, thanks to this great support of Iran, Qatar, the international community, generosity, everything turned to be this horrible terror city. One of the things we realized that every school, every mosque, every second house has and access to tunnel. So this is, and, and of course, immunity. But that's an argument for so, destroying the whole of Gaza, every single building in it. So do you have another solution, how to destroy the underground tunnel city, that this is the place where the terrorists hide, where they have all their ammunition, and this is the rockets that are still fired on Israeli cities. You know how Israel started its new year? We didn't have fireworks. We had rockets instead of fireworks. Hamas launched a big rocket attack on Israeli main cities in the center, including Tel Aviv, and all Israeli 
people were not celebrating that, in the streets of Tel Aviv. They were actually in shelters. But that is an argument for flattening the whole of Gaza. We're not. We're not. We're well, actually you, attacking clearly, infrastructure that is, is launching rockets you're, you're on not, our cities. You are not just attacking infrastructure. We can see that from the pictures. Now, I don't know how these pictures are edited, but you can see the, build, the devastated buildings, building after building after building after building. It, it, it's not forensic targeted strikes. It's whole streets that are being targeted, isn't it? Because the whole streets are connected to this metro underground tunnel city that is now being the basis of Hamas, the way they control their ability to attack our cities, sure. to but, attack but the, the, the logic innocent of that Israeli mean, people. The, the logic of that means, though, that if you believe that, I mean, and I'm sure there are lots and lots of tunnels under Gaza, but if you want to destroy them, that, that, that means destroying all the buildings that are on top of them as well. And that means effectively destroying the whole of the Gaza Strip. Now, there are 2.2 million people live uh, on the Gaza Strip. They, they've all been encouraged to go into one particular area. But how, how long is that going to last? I mean, how, there's going to be a huge humanitarian crisis soon, isn't there? Can I ask you, have you ever been to Tokyo? No. So my first international visit when I was deputy foreign minister was to Tokyo. And the first tour in the city was to tell me nothing is authentic, nothing is original because the Americans destroyed everything in the Second World War. Basically, Tokyo was devastated. All buildings were taken off. 100,000 people were killed just in one, air, one night of airstrikes by the Americans. And Tokyo got back to life because uh, after... Um, the Japanese being defeated by the Americans after a long run American occupation and a whole change of educational system. Tokyo and the modern Japan has become the great country that everyone admires with its great technology. I think we need to remember that the problem is not the devastated uh, devastation of the buildings. The problem is the ideology. And Israel is doing everything to make sure the two million Palestinians will be in a place called the Muasi with legitimate shelters together with all the international organizations to make sure we minimize the casualties. But again, it was Hamas that was using these people as human shields. It, it, Hamas didn't mind about children getting killed in Gaza. They were using them in front of every place that the IDF soldiers were getting. They saw children coming in front of them or, or women just to make sure they get the right footage for the international community to blame Israel. And when this is the reality, we need to fight this ideology that created this horrific thing that the, the people of Gaza um, were, were forced to be human shields. This is the problem. So Tokyo was rebuilt. Gaza can be rebuilt. The only question is what type of ideology we're going to have. Are we going to have a Nazi ideology? Or are we going to have peace-loving people, just like Israel has a peace with Egypt, with Jordan, with UAE, Morocco and Bahrain. And I believe that a better future will happen if we'll take this role model of Japan and we'll make sure the Palestinians will have a better future. Um, well, we'll come to your calls in a moment. Lots of people calling in already. 0345 6060 um, But I, I, I want to put this to you because um, Al Jazeera are reporting that the European Union uh, foreign policy chief, Josep Borrell, has said the international community must impose a solution to the uh, Israeli Hamas war as both sides are unable to come to terms. He says, I believe that we've learned in these 30 years that the solution has to be imposed from outside because two parties will never be able to reach an agreement. What's your reaction to that? That the peace that was achieved with Egypt was by bilateral discussions between Menachem Begin and Anwar Sadat. And it's actually proven that you cannot achieve peace unless the two sides are actually interested in a peace. So it's actually the other way around. And this is what history has proven as well. Also, going back to the uh, relationship with the Gulf countries, yes, uh, President Trump has uh, a big play and role in that. But it was after long years of Israel getting closer to those countries and having very close security and other relationship with, with, with those countries. So we know how to achieve peace. We have a proven record in achieving peace. I'm sure all Israelis want to have peace. But it's so just... People will laugh when you say that. No, they shouldn't laugh because 
If you see a country in the world that has a peace with six different Arab countries, that we want to make sure that uh, our region will be prosperous, that you can see Israel, since it was established, always called for having peace with uh, its Arab neighbors. But you don't see the same type of calling from the other side. You actually see the policy of the Palestinian Authority is paying salaries to terrorists that kill innocent Jews. This is something that is totally unacceptable. And they cannot even condemn the massacre over 90 days after it happened. And I think this is, this is something that everyone should think and ask themselves, why it's so hard to condemn a massacre of innocent, over a thousand innocent women, children so and men. So you've got the European Union wanting to impose a peace. You've now got South Africa reporting Israel to the International Court of Justice for genocidal acts in Gaza. I- I- Israel is becoming isolated in the world community. Oh, no, it's not what I see. I see uh, the deepest relationship and alliance we ever had with our American friends. I see uh, very close support that we get from our British uh, friends here, definitely the British government that supports all the actions of Israel to make sure Hamas won't exist. Well, up up to a point, because Rishi Sunak and David Cameron, have their their language has markedly changed in the past few weeks. But let me actually address the South African uh, thing. I've never seen something more absurd than that. This is really a victim blaming. Israel is the victim of the atrocities of Hamas it was Hamas that wanted to commit a genocide. It was clear when you see the amount of weapons, and we show that to all the official visitors, uh, including the Speaker of Parliament that came to Israel, it was prepared to uh, uh, days of days of genocide, killing every single Israeli if they just could. So this is what Hamas was planning. And just to let you know about the history of the genocide um, war crime, it was based on the idea that the Germans wanted to create this gen- horrible genocide with the Holocaust. And it was actually to prevent another Holocaust that the Jewish people were the victims of. So maybe South Africa wants to blame the Jews also for the Nazi Holocaust. I don't know. I mean, this is as absurd as it gets. And I really think that uh, this is why Israel is going to be in Hague, is going to uh, present its case and to make sure... Israel isn't a member of the ICJ. Is it, or is, is it sort of rejected it, its But Israel is part the of the Genocide Convention because right. of the history of the Holocaust. Okay. So this is very important for us to make the case to to claim that it's actually Hamas that needs to be put in court for a genocide crimes and their genocide intention. Right. I, I could spend the rest of the hour interviewing you myself, but I want to put it over to our callers yes, because please. a lot of people want to have a word with you. Uh, if you've just tuned in and wondering who I'm talking to, I'm talking to Zippy Hodavelli, who's the Israeli ambassador to the United Kingdom, and she's here with me until eight o'clock. Abdullah is in Ilford. Abdullah, hi. What would you like to ask? Hi, um, Zippy, I'd like to ask you that. First, you're saying there's no, there's no two-state solution to this. Uh, so, I mean, if I can respond to your, to your answer as well, if, if, I, if I'd be allowed that um, courtesy to whatever... Re- whatever well, be as whatever brief as you can, Abdullah, you. because there are a lot of yeah, people who want to get on. Yeah, fine. But basically, look, I mean, you're saying there's no, there's no, there's no two-state solution. So does that mean the people of the Palestinians the Palestinian could be subjugated continuously like they've been doing for the past 75 years and that the bombings that have taken place you're talking only about October but all the bombings that have taken place in 2008, 2012, 2014 and even the march of, everybody knows about the, um, the um, uh, march of return where people where snipers killed uh, unarmed civil, um, civ- um, Palestinian civilians so all this massacre that's taken place and you're saying that there's no two state solution so does that mean that Palestinians will have to undergo another 75 years of continuous brutality? As I said again, the Palestinians refused time after time to have their own state. And they said time after time that the reason is because they want to have a state from the river to the sea, which means Israel shouldn't exist. And the other issue is Israel said time after time, we have no interest governing the Palestinians. Palestinians can govern themselves. The only thing we're not interested with is to make the people in Israel under a danger and to give them the ability to threaten Israel. So this is what happened in the Gaza Strip. So the Gaza Strip was a bad test case of independence Palestinian ruling. And since 2005, there was zero control, zero settlement. You couldn't blame Israel for anything to do to the Gaza Strip. Well, well but, up to but, a point, what, because there, there was a blockade. Um, there, 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 there were there supplies is, that weren't allowed to get in. It's uh, not true, because well, it's, the Rafah cross, cross for Egypt was open. And 
the Gazans got as much supplies to create this monstrous underground tunnel city. So I guess there were many supplies there because we're talking about over 300 million dollars that was just to create the tunnel, you know, infrastructure. So we're talking about a lot of money could feed a lot of Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. So think about what were the Palestinians doing with all those resources. Uh, I'm afraid that this is the main reason why um, the Palestinians just refused to have their own state and to make sure the future will be better. But that was the past. We've got to look to the future. Absolutely. This is why I think that if you don't deal with the ideology in a way, you miss the whole point. If you keep on having a Third Reich ideology, you end up with Jews are not interested to be threatened again in genocide. And I think I think we have all the, all the right to protect ourselves. Okay, let's go to Gwen in Twickenham. Gwen, hi. Oh, hello. Good evening, Ian. Good evening, Ambassador. Thanks for taking my call. Go ahead. Okay, so today in the papers, um, it was um, announced that there is a group of Israelis, uh, quite influential Israelis, intellectuals, academics, scientists, etc., who have put a letter together, there's lots and lots of them, to denounce the rhetoric used by the Israeli media, government, um, and various influencers in Israel, um, a language which is of genocidal influence, and they are very concerned that this is becoming this sort of extreme far-right language. It has made it into everyday language. And I would like to know what the ambassador thinks of this, because I have heard her over time use um, genocidal language herself. And it's very, very strange that she, she describes the South African action as absurd when some very, uh, her very own Israeli uh, citizens are also uh, claiming very similar uh, issues with the way the government conducts itself. Well, I think everyone agrees that Hamas Charter, which is uh, the very basic constitution of Hamas, is speaking out loud and clearly about genocide of the Jewish people as part of a jihadi ideology. So it's clear that Hamas has this type of ideology to destroy the Jewish people and to see it as the same thing to kill innocent people. This what is about your, your fellow citizens who, who are denouncing the language and the rhetoric which is genocidal used by your very your own government, what do you say to them? That this is absolutely not the government's policy. The government's policy is to fight a recognized terror organization. Hamas is a terror organization. The Americans recognize it. The British government recognize it. We are fighting okay, the most okay, legitimate Hamas, war. What about your own government's language? We know that Hamas is a terrorist organization. I am not denying this. I'm interested in the way you are depicting the actions in the Gaza Strip and using increasing genocidal language and normalizing that language in your everyday rhetoric. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I think that it's clear that Israelis want to live next to their Arab neighbors. We need to remember 20%. Why they treat the, the Palestinians the way they treat them in the West Bank? And no, excuse me. 20% case? of Israelis are Israeli Arabs and we live together with, with a coexistence and we believe that Jews and Arabs should live next to each other. The only problem is terrorism and we need to address this problem because what happened on October 7th cannot be repeated and we need but to make let, sure it won't be repeated. Let me give you an example of what I think Gwen is referring to here. National Security Minister Ben Gavir said that the war in Gaza presents, and this is a quote, an opportunity to concentrate on encouraging the migration of the residents of Gaza. Well, what, what can that mean apart from ethnic cleansing? I have no idea about where he's coming from with these ideas because it has nothing to do to official government policy, well, as a, I said. He's the national security minister. But it's not part of government policy. Well, why, he's speaking on behalf of, why of would his your own prime ideas. minister allow his national security minister to utter provocative statements like that? You should definitely ask that the prime minister. <laughs> well, give me the opportunity. I'd love to. But. I know. But, but seriously, I mean, this is not the government's policy. The government's policy is speaking very clearly that we need to make sure that the Gaza Strip will never be a threat again on Israel. We need to dismantle Hamas capabilities. We need to make sure this underground terror city won't exist. We need to make sure that Gaza will be dem- demilitarized and de-radicalized. All those things are part of government's policy, and we want to do that together. 
together with different partners in the Arab world and in, you know, the Western world. Gwen, thank you very much. We'll come to more of your calls in just a few moments' time. But first, let's get the RBC News headlines from Amelia Cox. It's the Israeli ambassador to the UK has blamed Iran for escalating violence in the Middle East following two explosions at an Iranian ceremony. Zippy Hotavelli has been talking to LBC after more than 100 people were killed at a commemoration for a senior military commander. More heavy rain is expected in southern England tomorrow as much of the country clears up after Storm Henk. A man died after strong winds brought a tree down onto his car in Gloucestershire. And a 15-year-old is being questioned on suspicion of murder by police investigating the death of a teenager on New Year's Eve. Harry Pittman, who was 16, was stabbed to death on Primrose Hill in North London just before midnight on Sunday. LBC weather winds easing tonight with spells of rain and showers for northern areas. Showers clearing for most in the south, lows of freezing. Weekdays from 7 a.m. Why the hold up, Minister? Straight to the point. That's the reality, isn't it? Teachers are going to lose their jobs. Nick Ferrari at breakfast on LBC. Why does it take three years? I could get this done in three days. Listen on your radio and global player, the official LBC app. Ian Dale, text 84850. This is LBC. 7.34 on LBC. Hope you're watching us on Global Player. Zippy Hotovelli is with me, the Israeli ambassador to the United Kingdom, taking your calls. Let's go to John in Larnaca in Cyprus. Hello, John. Hi, good evening, ambassador. Hello. Um, I'll uh, I'll be very, very quick. Um, So, uh, firstly, I condemn what happened on October the 7th. It was very wrong. Any loss of life is, is, is tragic. Israelis... Um, Arabs, it's tragic. But the question I have for you is um, the, the, your Prime Minister, Mr Netanyahu, has been repeatedly saying that he's going into Gaza, bombing Gaza, because he wants to kill the Hamas leaders. Is that correct? He wants to make sure Hamas won't have the ability to do the 7th of October again. Part of it is the leadership, yes. But he wants to take out the leaders. Is that correct? Yes, we said yes. that so where did the, whoever so the was in charge of um, planning this horrific devil plan of killing innocent people in their beds yeah. in their pajamas he needs yeah, to yeah, pay yeah, the yeah. price I, I know i know that it's terrible it's tragic so where was this guy taken out last night what country was he in 
again, as, as I said, the man that was killed last evening was an archive terrorist of Hamas. And yeah, which it, country was he in? That's the question. Which country was he in? What do you mean? Was he, was, was he in the Gaza? No, but we said... He was in Lebanon. Okay, so uh, I'll share with you a piece of our history. Um, did you ever heard about the massacre of the 11th Israeli uh, sportsmen in the delegation that went to the Olympics in Munich. Yeah, but we, we, no, Did no, you so ever heard about it? No, because my, my, my question no, is, because I want to give last you night, last night. I'm, I'm not here for a history lesson. I'm asking you the question. Well, so sometimes history gives a context night, to Hamas things. Leader, the Hamas leader that got killed last night was in Lebanon. So someone is a geography lesson, whether it's your prime minister, your military. Oh, no, definitely not. Uh, we said that no matter where Hamas leaders are, they're not safe. 20,000 people have been killed in Gaza, and yet you take out a man, a top man of Hamas, in Lebanon. But he, but he was the, he was the, he was the deputy leader of their military wing. Surely that would legitimise him as a target, John. Yeah, but yeah, but they took him out in Lebanon, not so? in, not in Gaza. So, so they're, they're I'm just going back. I'm just going back to our history. So the Munich massacre terrorist. They were all killed in different parts of the world, some of them in Europe, uh, with Israeli security forces. And this was part of Israel's uh, clear message to the world. Terrorism doesn't pay off. John, I'm going to leave it there. We've got lots of calls coming in. Jay is in Wilston. Hello, Jay. Hi, and thanks for taking my call, and good evening, Ambassador. Um, so you spoke at the very beginning about making Israeli people safe, which is absolutely right. Do you agree, then, that maintaining and even expanding illegal Israeli settlements in the West Bank doesn't actually make Israeli people safe? It actually makes them more at risk of harm. And as you'll be aware, there are countless former IDF soldiers, Israeli NGOs, Israeli academics, Holocaust survivors that have all condemned the illegal settlements. So when will you dismantle them and when will you withdraw from the occupied territories? So uh, I really, really appreciate your question because it's it's a myth that the settlements are obstacle to peace. We removed... Well, they're not helping oh, it, are well, they? Wait a second, wait a second. Say, we, I didn't say, I didn't say they, they were obstacle to peace. I just said they're illegal settlements. When will you dismantle them because well, they're illegal? And when will you withdraw from the occupied territories? So because this is my answer to you. Occupying is illegal. Israel made sure that we went back to the international border in 2005, all settlements being moved. And as you know, the result was Hamas took over the Gaza Strip and he saw all the communities that were behind the Green Line, all those uh, flourishing communities in Beiri, in Kfaraza, Sderot, Ofakim, all those cities for, for Hamas, they were settlements. So it means Israel in general is one big settlement for this ideology. So it has nothing to do to settlements. I personally think that they are totally legal because they are based in a place that where the Jewish people are connected over 3,000 years. We're more connected probably to the settlements in Judea and Samaria more than many places in the center of Israel because well, that's an this is our history. More. But again, when Israel removed the settlements, what was the result? Did we see any peace c- came up from that? Actually, things got more radical. And you know what? If the plan, this horrible plan of Hamas to uh, attack Israel from all fronts was being accomplished, we would have found people being attacked from the West Bank in Tel Aviv because it's just 20 minutes away. So I don't see any future where Israel can withdraw from the settlements because they're actually the only way to make sure security will be saved in Tel Aviv. But some of the actions from the settlers have been disgraceful, haven't they, over the past few weeks? In, in, in I, what, I think how they've been attacking Palestinian refugees. For so example. Israel is uh, is a country that respects the rule of law. Everyone that is committing any type of crime is being brought to justice. And this is as opposed to the Palestinians that are actually paying salaries to terrorists. Can't you see the difference? Israel is a country of rule of law and the Palestinians are rewarding terrorists. This, th- th- you cannot even start talking about uh, violence uh, in Israel because the violence in Israel is being addressed by the courts. The violence in the Palestinian Authority being rewarded. Let, let's look at a very different aspect of all of this. Uh, Mark in Brent Cross has sent in this text. Stephen Fry got a lot of criticism for calling out anti-Semitism in his alternative Christmas message on Channel 4. Has the ambassador noticed an increase in anti-Jew hate here in Britain? And what should Rishi Sunak do about it? Well, first of all, I thought that Stephen Fry was very brave by 
you know, delivering this as a Christmas message because he speaks on behalf of many Jewish people in this country that feel like this is not the same country that they remember because Britain as a state always respected the Jewish community. And I think that nowadays we can feel many Jews live in fear. And I know the Prime Minister and the Home Secretary are very much committed to fighting anti-Semitism, including the head of the opposition. But more needs to be done to make sure that the Jews don't feel like they live in fear. Right, let's go to uh, Cherie, who is in uh, New York City. Hello, Cherie. Hi, thank you for taking my call. I obviously have to use a fake name. Um, I would love to just address this fake idea of democracy in the state of Israel because I am a Palestinian who has Israeli citizenship, who the ambassador is actually referring to. And I can tell you firsthand account that we don't have anything close to equal rights in Israel. I've lived in the UK, I've lived in the US, I've lived in over eight countries. And Israel is one of the most racist, ethnocratic countries I have ever lived in. 70% of my grandfather's land was stolen. The state treats us as second-class citizens. I had to go to checkpoints day in, day out as a child. I had guns pointed at me various times by Israeli soldiers with no accountability. And even though we're citizens, we can't live in 65% of Jewish towns because they have these things called admission committees that decide who can and can't live in those towns to keep the Palestinians out. We can't even teach our history in Israel. Okay. We can't say the word Nakba. Shuri, I, I, I need time, you to get to a question. Thing, the first time that we heard the word Nakba from Israeli officials is when they started saying that they were going to commit a second Nakba to the Palestinians in Gaza. So I want to know, after of us living in occupation with our lives under their mercy, willy-nilly, they can do whatever they want to us, how does the ambassador sit here in all honesty and say that they are the victims? We're literally at their, at their mercy. They have no accountability, no due process. Soldiers can go in and out of our houses with no choice by us. And she sits here and says that we have democracy and that they are the victims. It's absolutely Cherie? ridiculous. Your name is Cherie. Um, I just I just want to ask you, do you understand that the massacre that happened on October 7th was unprovoked attack on innocent people? Do you understand I that? I do understand when you say unprovoked, when you have people under siege, it's not unprovoked. It's no, excuse attack. me, there I is agree, no siege. There is We've no siege. From 2005, there was no siege on the Gaza. The only siege was Hamas. Sh- sh- Shari, 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 this only works if you let the ambassador answer your question, and then, then I'll let you come back. But it doesn't work if you talk over her all the time. Sure, go ahead. All I'm saying is from 2005, Gaza was free. Gaza was free to become a Middle East Singapore. You got tons of international support, Qatari support, and Iranian support that, as we know, turned out to be this horrific underground tunnel city that had only one aim. It, ha- it wasn't for the benefit of the Palestinians. It wasn't for a better future for the Palestinian children. It was Hamas that destroyed the future of the children of Gaza. Do you understand that? Abusing the money, abusing the humanitarian aid was given by the international community, abusing every single penny, dollar and pound that was getting into the Gaza Strip. Okay, let me answer that. I understand that anything that goes in and out of Gaza was, uh, had to be um, approved by Israel. I understand that I, if I wanted to visit Gaza, which is only an hour away from where I live, had to get Israeli permission. I understand that if anyone wanted to leave Gaza, had to give Israeli permission, had to get Israeli approval and permission. So this idea that Gaza is free is absolutely, again, ridiculous. I love the fact that they spread this image that Gaza was free. It's, it's been under siege and blockade. I mean, it's an insult to our intellect when they say that Gaza was free. They think we're stupid, but that's not the case. Well, I'm, I'm afraid that the result is that Hamas was the one who destroyed the future of the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. And it's a shame you cannot understand that this terror organization basically destroyed the Gaza Strip. OK, Cherie, thank you. Uh, ben is in Brighton. Hello, Ben. Hi there, Ian. Good evening. Um, I would like to say to this woman who I've heard interviewed quite no, frequently. She, and she I is, find- ben. If you're going to continue in that vein, we won't continue because she's the Israeli ambassador. um, She's not this woman. She's the ambassador. I don't know her name, Ian. Well, I've said it often enough. You can call me the ambassador. It's okay. Okay, ambassador. Like you would have addressed the men if we was in that position. You would have called them that men, probably. I would have. But I just I didn't know your name. So I apologize for any offense caused in that. Okay. May I say this? please? Please ask a question. Up until the attack that happened, which was a totally atrocious attack, I considered that there were two sides in this. There was a murderous death cult, abhorrent, called Hamas, and a civilised democracy on the other side. 
one of these decided to attack another one. And that is not to be forgiven. Please hear me. It really isn't. However, a civilised democracy does not assassinate its enemies in a third country. President Putin of Russia assassinates his enemies because he doesn't want to have to deal with dealing with whatever their frustrations are. A civilised democracy does not kill, target and kill a person, whatever they think their differences are, in another country. And Israel is losing, I think, support because the two, Israel and Hamas, are not equitable in any way, shape or form. There is no way that I agree that they are equitable. Hamas is a murderous death cult and it committed unimaginable atrocities on you guys and for which I send my heart and my love. But you don't, because if civilised democracies suddenly unilaterally decide who they are going to kill in other countries then the whole world order breaks down and we end up in chaos. It is not acceptable to assassinate people. Okay, well, um, can, I, can a, I answer yeah, that? Yeah, that's a reasonable question. Your name, is, your name is Ben, right? Yeah. Ben? Yes, it is. So I just want to say, first of all, I really appreciate your sympathy to what happened in October 7th. And I don't get to hear that a lot. Sometimes people forget what happened. And you definitely remember and you definitely appreciate Israel as a democracy. The only thing I can say, and again, I cannot refer to who did um, the assassination yesterday, the airstrike. But I can say only one thing. I'm sure you believe that America, United States of America, is a civilized democracy. And they killed bin Laden. So as far as I know, Civilized democracies are fighting leaders of terrorists. And this is part of of their claim to fame, that the world is a safer place when those leaders are not leading anymore this horrible ideology. Okay, Ben, thank you very much indeed for your question. We'll come to more in just a moment at 7.48. LBC. Right. 
Ian Dale on LBC. Text 84850. 10 to 8, we have Zippy Hotovelli for the purposes of Ben in Brighton there. Israeli ambassador to the United Kingdom with us taking your calls. You can watch us on Global Player. We're also going to, the ambassador won't be with us, but after nine o'clock, we're going to continue the discussion on this subject. But of course, cross question will intervene between eight and nine. A text question from uh, Matthew in Harrogate. What hope does the ambassador have that this war will be over by the end of 2024? Well, it's definitely my prayers go to hoping that this war will be over. Do you think it will be? Um, I know that, at least from uh, the IDF, um, the senior chief of staff, they're speaking about months. So we're going to have a few more months of this front. And again, as we all understand, we need to bring back our people in the north in a new situation that actually respects the 1701 UN resolution after the Second Lebanon War. It was talking that Hezbollah won't be so close to the communities in the north of Israel. So we need to solve solve that as well, hopefully diplomatically. Right, let's go to David in Hendon. Hi, David. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Um, good evening, Ambassador. Um, I have a question. With your permission, I'd like to just say uh, one sentence beforehand. I didn't fully understand what Ben was trying to say. Because if I'm not mistaken, Ambassador, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is Obama watched bin Laden being assassinated in, in a, I mean, he was watching him on his own TV, watching him being assassinated in a totally different country. What was Ben trying to say? Terrorist leaders are terrorist leaders. They deserve and they should be taken out wherever they're trying to hide. OK, um, so my question, Ambassador, is what role do you see Israel playing? in Gaza after the war is all over? Oh, that's an excellent question. So, uh, as you know, Israel doesn't want to govern Gaza. The only thing we're interested with is to make our communities in the south safe. And in order to achieve that, we need to make sure all this amount of weapons won't get into the Gaza Strip. So Gaza must be demilitarized. This is this is our goal. This is what our prime minister said. And in order to achieve that, uh, I'm afraid, again, we need to use our power in order to make sure that the underground tunnel city will be destroyed and that Gaza won't become, again, another terror, this horrible terror city. And this is the role that Israel wants to play. Israel wants to, p- to play the role of security and Everything to do with civilian uh, facilities, we are very much open to partners. Uh, I know some partners in the Arab world, I know the UAE um, can be a great partner. I know that uh, many Western countries uh, would like to to play a role in that. And as I said, I think education must be a key for a better future. You cannot uh, continue with this horrific ideological education that is demonizing Jews. David, thank you. Uh, Bulama is in Lambeth. Very good evening to you. What would you like to ask? Evening, Ian. Uh, thank you for hosting this. Uh, Ambassador, you have highlighted um, for the past 15 minutes or so that the major problem is Hamas's ideology, and it is what you are targeting. In what way do you think the bombings are addressing the ideology? How do you think the killing of 10,000 children and the destruction of 60% of civilian infrastructure, including schools and hospitals, how do you think that will address the ideology? Do you, Ambassador, in all honesty, think that the average innocent Palestinian is now more likely since September, uh, October 7th to join uh, Hamas, or do you think they are less likely to join uh, Hamas because of your actions? That, that's an excellent question, because uh, when we are bombing in Gaza, we're bombing infrastructure that um, are, is creating the capabilities, places where rockets being launched towards cities of Israel. And we're making sure that Hamas won't have the capabilities. You're absolutely right. And this is what you're implementing. Ideology is all about education. It's not, you know, from bombing. And this is not the way to solve ideological problems. Uh, but To begin with, every time you have an enemy, the first thing you need to make sure that he won't have capabilities to hurt you. So this is what Israel is doing at the moment. About the future and uh, what will create a better future, um, I want to go back to the 6th of October. At the 6th of October, Israel was giving permits to Palestinians from Gaza to come and work 
in those Israeli communities. As a result, those people spied after the families and they gave information to the terrorists of Hamas and they volunteered to be part of the massacre. So uh, Israelis were dreams about a coexistence were shattered at the 7th of October. You need to understand how deep the betrayal was that the same people that we said, you can be part of our communities, that those were the most peace-loving communities back then in the South. Some of the people being murdered by those Hamas terrorists, they wanted to have peace with the Palestinians. They wanted to see a better future. So it's actually the, the Hamas ideology that educated this uh, you, this whole generation you, you can't bomb an against ideology, Israel. Can you? No, That's absolutely not. I think we're bombing infrastructure. I'm not. Don't don't get me but, wrong. But, but I, th- I think Balama's point was, and I think it is a, it is a well made one, that if you are a teenager, whether whether you're in Gaza or indeed the West Bank, I suspect you are more likely to become radicalised by the events of the past three three weeks, three months, sorry, um, that, than you would have been before. And isn't that an indictment of the the Israeli strategy? No, because um, I'm thinking about every normal country in the world. Think about Manchester, Birmingham and London being attacked at the same time. That was Hamas' plan to attack us from the north, from the east and from the south. The plan didn't work out thanks to the Israeli army that in the end managed to block the Hamas attack. But think about your main cities being attacked brutally by terrorists coming, invading, raping, killing, beheading children. This is, and kidnapping people. This is something that no normal country would say, well, we don't want to radicalize the enemy. No, the enemy came radicalized if it was able to do that. So uh, I'm going back again to the trauma of October 7th. The trauma of October 7th uh, was that Israel was trying to live peacefully next to the Gaza Strip. And we realized that ISIS mentality, Nazi mentality on our doorstep is something that we cannot live with. This is why we're fighting Hamas. This is why we want to make sure that the future leadership for the Palestinians will understand that terrorism is not the way to go with Israel. Um, Liam in Kensington says, is the ambassador pleased about Lord Cameron becoming foreign secretary? Have have his visits been helpful? Well, I think Lord Cameron was your former prime minister. I was a foreign secretary. He had a very meaningful visit in Israel. I was walking with him in Kibbutz Be'eri and I was hearing his speech in, in the traditional candle lighting for Hanukkah and he said it was one of the most moving thing he experienced to see um, a peaceful places that turned out to be uh, this um, you know devastated area of, of deserted ghost towns in Israel and I think that uh, David Cameron uh, as a foreign secretary is someone that has a lot of experience and he brings his experience but to the region. But he has used the, the C word hasn't he? He's called for a sustainable ceasefire. I actually think that if you read the article that he published with his colleague, his German colleague he was speaking very clearly that before Hamas being eliminated you cannot go for a ceasefire because then October 7th will happen again. So when they're talking about sustainable they're definitely speaking about the reality that Hamas does Exist. Um, final question. I haven't got time to go to him, but Damien in rugby wanted to talk to you about the Israel, um, Israeli Iranian Revolutionary Guard. Um, sh- should the UK prescribe the IRG? I said in the past, this is a UK decision, but we definitely think that Iran is the head uh, behind all the disability in our region. It sponsors Hezbollah, it sponsors Hamas, it sponsors the Houthis. You can see that everything that wants to take our region to a place of conflict is coming with the regions of of Iran. And since the UK agrees with us that this is um, one of the main problems in our region, um, I, I trust the UK government to do the right thing. Ambassador, thank you very much for spending the last hour with us. Um, my callers have put you through the ringer a little bit at, at, at no, times. No, I think, I think it was a very good way to start my year. <laughs> well, we'll have you back in the future. Thank, thank you very you. much Thank you. I'd like indeed. to thank to all the people who asked their questions. Thanks, thank thanks very much. Right, coming up in the next hour, uh, you may want to ask a question on this subject on Cross Question. It's uh, Wednesday's Cross Question. We have a panel consisting of the editor of Labour List.
Belgium. Conservative electoral strategist Joe Tanner, uh, Dr. Sam Fowles will be with us, campaigner and lawyer, and Phoebe Arsanovic Little, uh, think tanker and campaigner, she'll be with us too. The number to call 0345 6060 973. We've cleared the board so you will be able to get through, but we'll also continue our discussion on Israel and Gaza after nine o'clock in that hour as well. <laughs>